It is a glorious Monday, March 14th, 1 p.m. on the East Coast. Sunny out here, at least in the Morristown, New Jersey area. I'm Guy Adami. Today, I'm going to be joined by the great Carter Worth. Dan Nathan is off this week. Today's market call is brought to you by FactSet. Financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. And of course, Carter, you know this, open exchange because they manage the virtual meetings that matter for the top companies around the world. And I will tell you, our meetings at one o'clock Eastern time have mattered for some time. And I will say today probably matters for another reason. We're going to get into it, Carter. But, you know, I'm looking at the market, started off higher, starting to give a little back here. Obviously, the NASDAQ underperforming. Before we get into it, what are your thoughts in terms of what you've seen for the first sort of three and a half hours or so of the day? Well, you know, today's action is telling in the sense that it's very uh, similar to what we saw on Friday and what we've seen many days. When you're in a bullish phase, um, you, you have uh, basically strong closes. And when you're in a bearish phase, and, and I, we know this having been on desks for years, you slip. And it's just like in life, there's something, you don't stick your landing. Great gymnasts, right? They do the triple and then they nail it. When you wobble, you, they take points off. The market keeps having these hopeful rallies intraday, but it never quite sticks its landing. And you saw it very uh, much the case on Friday. You're seeing it today. It was up. Futures now slipping. It's just bad price action. Yeah, they're not going to carry Strug this one, as they say. I was a Nadia Comaneci fan myself, but that's going way back, Carter, to yes, the 1970s, is. I believe. But let's take a look at the SPX because, you know, I think, again, this speaks to sometimes you have to visually see what's going on. We can talk about it all you want, but as they say, as the Rod Stewart song goes, a picture tells a story, don't it? And the picture is worth a thousand words. And again, it's worth mentioning. This was lower left to upper right for quite some time, basically since we bottomed out in March, April of 2020. And you've seen us significantly higher than the 200-day moving average. This 50-day moving average has basically been, been a trend line for the market. But it's all sort of turning, Carter, and it turned again in late November. This is worth mentioning. Now, I know the market continued to go higher into December. I would attribute that to seasonality, but something changed in November. And effectively, what changed long before Russia, Ukraine, what changed is the Fed changed their stance, their policies, and the market is picking up on that. Now, people will look at this and say, Carter, that 50 days about to trade through the 200 day. Is that important? You look at this chart. What does it say to you? Well, it is important. So we know that if moving averages are just automated trend lines. We could draw lines and we do uh, often on, on this um, program on this show. And, and what we know is that it takes a lot of work to draw lines. So the reason we use moving averages, and it's important for everyone, is to try to automate that process. And there are two things to look for. Um, it's when a short-term moving average crosses under, in terms of a uh, rolling over phase, a longer-term moving average. It's it's the so-called death cross. Now, I will put in a small plug here for something that's quite better. The 150-day moving average turns flat before the 50 crossed the 200. So not only is it using one line, the 150, one line instead of two, it flattens 80% of the time before the 50 crossed the 200. Either way, this is what a reversal looks like. It has all the elements of a bullish to bearish reversal. Yeah, and it's important to look at this chart. Now, let's just back out March, April of, of 2020, because I think we all understood what happened there. But when this 50-day crossed the 200-day on the upside, so sort of talk about late June, early July of 2020, markets never look back. Effectively, the markets never look back. So if you're looking for an indicator, if you just go back and look at what happens, and that would be instead of a death cross, that was known as a golden cross, you can see what's happening. And again, maybe the market puts on the brakes here. Maybe we have some mind-numbing rally on the back of whatever news flow that can come out. But right now, the market appears vulnerable. And this is a chart that we've watched, Carter. And I think it's obviously a chart we need to continue to watch. The next one we have to watch, which I think is actually more bearish than the S&P, I think you would agree with me on this one, is the NDX, the NASDAQ 100. And this seems to be, it seems as if, it doesn't seem, this has happened. The 50-day has crossed the 200-day. And I would add, Carter, and I think you would echo this, the 200-day for the first time in a while, instead of being lower left to the other right, is flattening out, and presumably we're about to change course on that. That's exactly right. And so here, too, our automated trend line, in this case the 200, is now no longer rising. So 
it's the uptrend is gone. The question, and it's always hard to figure, well, if it's a new downtrend, it is, how far does it carry? Nobody knows the answer to that, but what we have to respect is changes in trend. And again, the 150 moving average flattened out almost five weeks ago, and there's every indication that there's lower prices ahead. Yeah, I agree. And I like doing this because you taught me this. If we could toggle back quickly to that S&P chart, people say, well, what are the levels you're looking at, Guy? And I just want to bring them up. I think the logical level, and not because it's just a round number, but 4,000 to me seems a logical level. But what I'll tell you is, and Carter, I don't know how you feel about this, 3750 seems to be in play. And why is that? Well, if you go back again, early 2021, sort of late, early spring, late winter, that's where we sort of accelerated. That's where we took the next leg higher in this bull market. So 4,000 to me, first stop logical. I think the ultimate goal is 3750. And I think you would submit in terms of a level it makes sense because that's sort of a measured move off what we call a head and shoulders pattern. That's exactly right. Well, a couple of things. It's a measured move, uh, which is to say, if you can identify a reversal formation, how far, just as a breakout or breakout, how far does it carry? And uh, the, the 3,700 plus minus level is that. It's also where we would be down 20% from our peak plus minus. And it's also, if you look at the 2009, 2022 channel in which the market essentially has been ascending uh, the entire time since the financial press, it's the midpoint of that very important long-term channel. And you mentioned uh, voices carry. Obviously, I think that was the motels, if I'm not mistaken. Hush, hush now, voices carry. But let's go to something you brought forth. And this is the Russell 3000. I want to make sure not to confuse people. This is not the small cap index, anything but. But you brought a number of charts to sort of illustrate some of the damage being done underneath the surface, Carter. Right. So the Russell 3000 just is the entire S&P 500 plus another 2,500 stocks. So it is the broadest essential uh, aggregate there is for the US representing 98% of the investable uh, stock market in US. And it's the same circumstance as the S&P. However, note that the S&P makes its high in October, November, and then makes a new high in January. The broadest aggregate, the Russell, never could make a new high on Jan 4th. So we have the head and shoulders, but also have a double top. It's not a good pattern. And if you look at this, this is short term. If you pull this back, we can, I think we've got a second iteration and this is longer term. You, you can sort of, it doesn't take much in terms of imagination to say, wow, if we ascended this much for that uh, long a time, what if the reversal, which is clearly that way, gives back more than it has? And that's the real risk. Now, I want to, once again, because you're with the two of us and Dan can't roll his eyes at me, I want you to take a visual of this chart. I want you to toggle back one chart, if you could. I want you to take a look at this. Now, again, this is illustrative of this did not, this is, did not reinforce or back up that move in the S&P 500. Now go back, if you can, one more toggle to the NDX, and it is a hauntingly similar chart. Why? Because, again, the NDX did not, again, back up that high we saw in the S&P 500. So if you think this chart looks dicey, if you think what we just showed you in form of the Russell 3000 looks dicey, it stands to reason that the S&P is probably going to be under some weight as well. So now let's go to a basically a, a comparison you brought with us, because this is really important as well, Carter Worth. So there's a lot of discussion often about breath, and it it. The, the way to think about market breadth, there's, there's things like advanced decline line. Those are concomitant uh, indicators. They're useless, frankly. The real concept of breadth is looking under the surface at the number of stocks. So let me say it a couple of ways. If you say, well, what's the average grade in the class? That means nothing. There could be a, right, or, or a sports season, a great, great game. You could have a Wilt Chamberlain carrying the day, and yet the whole team is lagging. The way you really figure out market structure uh, the arrangement of parts is to look at the underlying stocks, not the index, which is so cap weighted. And what's happened in the past three months from December 15th to now, and you see that here, is that breath has deteriorated uh, even further. But the mm -hmm. key is this, in December, Wall Street was exceedingly bullish. Strategists are stumbling over one another to raise their price targets for 2022. And yet already the internals were terrible. Look at those numbers. Basically, you know, half of all stocks have already lost 20%. Uh, 
and yet the streets bullish. Now, of course, the breath has gotten even worse, but finally strategists are doing their opposite. They're lowering their price targets for the year. Now, is that a sign, do you, do you think, I mean, if people will say that now that the analysts have capitulated, that's a sign of a potential bottom. And I could, listen, I get it. I could, I could back that up. But with that said, maybe they're going to be right this time. Maybe they're right to lower their numbers. And maybe they're just at the precipice of having to lower their numbers. Just your thoughts on that. Well, that's right. It, it's key because we, you need contrarian indicators. And we've all been the, the one who's blown it. Exactly contrarian when should have been going left, going right. And so to your point, the fact that strategists are finally maybe, not to say throwing in a towel, but reducing, one could say, ha ha, now we've got the contrarian indicator. But it's still too new. It mm -hmm. feels a little too nascent. You need capitulation. It does not feel like that to me. No, it certainly doesn't feel that way to me either. You know, these sell-offs have been, I would submit, again, I'm not suggesting today is any major sell-off. It's not. I mean, I think the Dow's still higher. The, NAS the NASDAQ's obviously a bit lower. The matter of fact, Carter, I'm just curious as your thoughts on this. We've mentioned this a, long, a, a number of times. The panic to me has been on the buy side over the last couple of months. It feels like more panic buying than panic selling. And what does that tell you? Is that sort of a characteristic of a bear market? Right. Well, there's a, a quote I committed to memory as a person of 25. I'm 55. And it is literally from the 1930s and 40s. Bear markets are characterized by sharp counter trend rallies providing excellent entry point for shorts. Meaning the real vigor has been these violent snapbacks. That's the FOMO. That's the, it's not usually over until people aren't willing to do that. The name that we've talked about, obviously, everybody wants to talk about it. It's the biggest company in the world. I don't think it's the most important company. It is the largest, um, but that's nuanced, I guess, is Apple. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Apple traded down to 152. The 200-day moving average that day was 151.60. You had a violent bounce to the upside on that very day. A couple of days of follow through the upside. I actually think we traded back north of 170 briefly, but now it's starting to give it up starting to give it up for a number of different reasons, some of which are really important. Obviously, I think the lockdowns in China are something worth mentioning. The potential for a China-Taiwan dust-up, I think that tail risk is out there. But you said this a couple of weeks ago when you saw that bounce. You thought Apple was going to not only test that 152 level, but break through it. And it's that was a bit of a prescient call, as they say. And this stock looks extraordinarily vulnerable. You talk about the generals being the last to go in terms of the market. And we seem to be on the precipice of that. I think the sell-off, a lot of people found refuge in Apple. We saw it obviously pretty clearly on those up days where I think people found Apple as sort of this flight to quality along with the bond market. But now there's a different story being told, Carter. That's right. There a couple of things before we look at the chart is that there's, it's very hard to sell some. We all know that, especially when you've got big gains and you're like, well, but I'm up fourfold, I'm up five, so it's down. You won't get people to really start to exit and still, until they've started to lose some real money. And if your cost base is from two, three, or even uh, longer, four or five years ago, people are reluctant to give up on something that's treated them so well. Uh, the key is this though, look at the chart. We are sitting on this trend line. We are uh, about to break trend. Now we can toggle here. We've got two iterations of Apple. So Apple is, uh, after breaking out from the key level, has undercut that level. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also back to the trend line. So if we go back and forth and look at these two. Uh, it's basically as big a juncture as you can have. And the third and final chart for Apple puts the two lines together. And so it's ever thus. You make a judgment. Is this the moment in which it bounces yet again or breaks? Uh, my judgment is the latter. It breaks. Yeah, I agree with you. And you know, it's what's interesting, you know, having done Fast Money for the better part of over 15 years now, you've obviously been a huge part of it for that period of time as well. And you do options action. The, the, the one stock that seems to really um, strike a nerve with people in terms of if you say anything remotely negative is Apple. For whatever reason, I'm not quite sure why that is. Obviously, again, I mentioned it's the largest company in terms of market cap, but you know, people seem to feel some kinship with this name. Okay, that's fine. But what we've pointed out, Dan and I, and you've pointed out as well, along the way on this miraculous move, this historical move in the stock, you've seen a number of peak to trough declines, anywhere from 25 
to 40%. And quite frankly, given the high we made back in December, we're on the pre we're not on a we're in the midst of one right now. So the question is, where does this thing resolve itself in terms of Apple? I will tell you, um, the logical place for me is sort of 137 and a half ish, the low that we bounced from in the fall of last year. I'm curious as to your thoughts. I think that's about right. I mean, levels are identifiable, and we try to say we're here now. If and as weakness continues, could we go to that level? And that's all you can do. But the key is to uh, not, I think, be bullish here. So I'm with you. I think your level is exactly right. We got a question um, from one of our viewers. I'm just going to read it. So forgive me for looking down for a second. Carter and or Guy, what do you think it would take for this market to correct right here and, and basically go no further to the downside, go no lower than we are right now? I'm going to take a stab at that, Carter, and I'll give you a couple minutes or a couple seconds to think about your thoughts. For me, uh, what would it take? Well, short of peace breaking out, obviously, in Eastern Europe, which I don't see happening anytime soon. That's number one. Uh, if the commodity market, for whatever reason, um, these historic moves we've seen were to abate and give a lot, a lot of these moves to the upside back. I think the most important, though, um, if this Fed, for whatever reason, decided, you know what, now's not the time to be hawkish, but we're going to pivot on our recent pivot, I think the market would construe that as positive. Um, I don't think any of those things are going to happen, though. I think what's going to take is capitulation to the downside, and quite frankly, as painful as it is, Carter, and I'm curious as to your thoughts, what this market needs is exactly what we're in the midst of now. We need to see that flush for a myriad of different reasons. It sort of separates the wheat from the chaff, and I think it, it allows us then to take the next leg higher, which I think is going to happen in the second half of 2022. Thoughts, Carter? Right. So the Fed's in a tough spot, obviously, because let's say they were to back away. Does that is that bullish or is that like, wow, they're so scared, mm -hmm. they don't know what to do either. Let's say they press on and they say, we've got to do a quarter and a quarter. There's very little narrative that can, uh, I would say, arrest the decline. A couple of things to consider. Again, the only way a market goes higher, and it's, it's very elemental, is you have earnings growth, you have multiple expansion, or you have some combination of the two. Now, is this a period in time where the earnings growth is robust over the next 12 months? No. Is this a period where you have multiple expansion, given what the Fed and other central banks are doing? No. And so uh, it's highly unlikely that it just abates here and goes higher. And then finally, just a guide to your point, we haven't had the flush in the sense that excess is always expunged. We haven't done that. And we looked at the chart of the NASDAQ 100, where all the concentration of capital is, where all the growth is, where all the innovation is. The NASDAQ 100 at the end of last year achieved 13 years of positive total return. No index, none has ever done that. Not the Dow since its inception, not the transports going back to the late 1800s. It's just too much. It needs to have some of its excess worked off. I agree with you. And the epicenter of all of this over the last couple of weeks has been the crude oil market, which has had fits and starts, but we need to talk about it. And you brought these charts with you, Carter. This is really interesting chart. Um, I, I think you need to speak to it because it's it basically we're looking at a potential huge head and shoulders pattern. This is obviously a three month chart, 60 minute bar chart, but it makes it no less important than some of the other charts you bring forth. Right. So time frames, all time frames are valid. And you know, the people who are day traders, the people who trade for two, three sessions, or people hold their Apple for 10 years and will never sell it no matter what. But the point is, you've got to be aware of them all. And this is a very uh, clear formation in terms of crude oil, which is the great run-up and now has all the elements of, of a reversal. It doesn't matter what you call it, but the, the concept is the same as we just looked at in the S&P or the Russell. It does take on the look of a shoulder, a head and a shoulder, and this is breaking down as we speak. But here's what's so key about this. If we now look at a longer term chart of crude, that where this is happening, this happened after sort of blowing off um, and breaking out to the upside of uh, the, the megaphone that, that crude has been in for so long. And so all signs point to sub 100. And I think we have a couple in a row here and you can look at them each one at a time. You see the next one, if and as we complete this head and shoulders. And if you look at the next one, 
and the final one has them all, all the lines together. The point is, uh, this is excess. This was news related, of course. And yet, again, uh, Russia counts what, eight to 10% of total supply, but crude went up 40, 50% in two weeks. It, it got ahead of itself. And this is a normal corrective process. It has all the elements of head and shoulders top on the intraday and a science point to sub 100. Yeah, there are your lines zooming right at them. I mean, the first line that first would subsequently be, it was a resistance line on the upside until we broke it, but now it'll be support. And it probably comes in around 98 and a half. The middle line to me is the most important because it feels as though if you start doing measured moves, that's where we're headed. And that probably gets you about 82 and a half, 83 or thereabouts. That's the one I want to sort of focus on, but they're all really important now. I would submit, I don't think we're going to see the lower end of that, but if we do, and that's going to be around 70 bucks ish there is something very dastardly going on probably in a lot of different markets, and crude becomes sort of uh, an ancillary or sort of a, um, it becomes a vehicle to sell to for uh, potentially a raising of capital. I mean, that could be, if you saw crude at 70 bucks, people would say that's going to be bullish for the equities market. I would submit if we get there in this environment, there's something far more nefarious going on. But that, again, that's what makes markets, Carter. The, the, the underlying equities that we talk about obviously find their way into the OIH. And we've mentioned uh, the importance of the OIH for a while. We'll take a look. This is the ETF basically comprised, again, important, of three stocks. Schlumberger, Halliburton, probably around 40% of it. Then you throw in us uh, Baker Hughes, and it gets you to effectively half the ETF. With that said, again... Looks pretty similar, doesn't it, to that chart we saw before. Bit of a blow off top. Now we're doing a back and fill. I think logically, if you look at it, you know, past resistance becomes support. And that past resistance came in the form of sort of 245, 260. Certainly appears, given the crude oil chart that you just showed us, a number of charts that were headed here in the OIH, Carter. That's right. So a breakout uh, from well-defined tops at a common level. Uh, at some point uh, is overdone. And quite often you'll check back to the level from which the breakout uh, took place. It's where support is. And support being there are people who bought there before the breakout, who actually have sold well a day ago or two days ago, who have a happy experience in OIH and will look to buy it back. They're like, wow, I get to try this again. There are also people who shorted at the high. Where do they start to cover? At the breakout point. And then finally, and this is why these levels work, there are people who were going to buy OIH, this Russia thing, I think, I, and then never did it, and it broke out. And there they are waiting with their nose pressed up against the glass looking in at the party. Their memory is anchored to where it broke out. If and as it falls back, they're like, this is where I was going to do it originally, and they come in. It's a big level. If you look at the second chart, um, it's the trend line in effect over the past, you know, four, five, six months. And if you put them together, uh, it's a key level, and it is an overlay of crude. Uh, and three stocks do dominate, but the bet is that it's uh, headed lower. I agree, and I'm glad you drew that horizontal line because I think that gives people visuals to what we were just talking about in terms of past resistance becomes support. And right here, you look at it's you know between 245 and 250, and it certainly feels like that's where we're headed. Now, it doesn't mean I think the overall move is over. But I think in the short term, exactly what we're speaking about, and Carter points out, we are. I mean, some of the best trading opportunities are when you see these blow-off tops and what happens on the way down. And we've shown you a number of them over the first 23 minutes or so. The one thing I've been watching, Carter, because I think this is really important, and we've talked about it literally for months now, is the HYG, the High Yield Bond ETF. And if we could sort of slide it, Earl, and go to that, you'll see what I'm looking at here. Why do I think this is important? Not necessarily because it trades all that robustly. But if you go back now over the course of 14 years, you can see some pretty monumental moves in this that have been accompanied by or preceded by a move in the equity market. We know what happened in 08 and 09. We could talk about sort of late 2011 into 2012. Obviously, 2016, there were certain things happening. I mean, we can go back on the calendar and pinpoint some of these things. Obviously, again, March, April of 2020, you see the HYG. Well, we're rolling over again, and we're rolling over in a pretty meaningful way. One has to ask, how does this resolve itself, and what does it mean? What is it telling us? So one thing we know is it, 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 it's a measure of uh, really the sort of the dirtiest stuff, right? The JNK, uh, HYG, these are uh, sort of 
not to say sub quality, but they're not, uh, you know, uh, high quality debt. And it's where a lot of risk is and where a lot of speculating and gambling go on. And these are in free fall. Uh, what we do see in each of those bottoms, they're big ricochets. It doesn't base, right? It ricochets and comes back. And so we look for that for a capitulation. But right now, there's nothing but stay away. We have a question from one of our guests. This is not um, something I talk about all the time, but Jay asked, isn't uh, the junk bond UST spreading hit, spread hitting 4%, giving us a no bueno sign for the market now? I can't speak all that intelligently about that because I haven't really looked at it all that much. But again, it's all part and parcel. I mean, if you want to look at LQD, that's something else we should be looking at as well. We don't have a chart. We'll share one with you tomorrow. But all these things are giving you warning signs. And again, we either choose to watch them, choose to um, take them into consideration, or we can bury our heads in the sand. Now, I understand, I think Carter does this as well. We realize that for 99.5% of people, stocks going higher is important it, because that's people are long stocks. I get it. But to just sit back blindly and not point out some of the things that we're seeing, we're not doing anybody a service. So I happen to think HYG is extraordinarily important to look at. Carter brought some great charts as well. Are there any other things that are sort of flashing before your eyes, Carter, that we should be taking into consideration before we get out of here today? I mean, if you think about this, the big banks, right, what they used to call money center banks, they're sort of the, the, the transmission mechanism for the economy and for the world. And if you look at the chart of Citibank and J.P. Morgan and Bank America and Wells Fargo, uh, something is wrong. And that's as good a place to sort of look for clues. If everything was okay, or the big banks would not be uh, on the ropes. And there's a message, whether it's that the recession is coming or that the geopolitics gets worse or that the loan losses are gonna increase or that the consumer is under pressure. But that alone means there's, there's something wrong. I agree with you. The banks are important to watch all the time without question. And Citibank, which is now trading, I wanna say, 72 percent ish of their tangible book by the way i think obviously we're going to see their tangible book value come down but with that said i mean that's been telling a story for a while now i will tell you i thought citibank was a buy at around 80 85 percent of tangible book that didn't play out but you know maybe citibank is telling you something in terms of their european exposure and again when you aggregate when you put together the eurozone you have the largest economy in the world i think you have about a 450 uh excuse yeah 450 million people in terms of an economy and i think you have a gdp that's probably north of what we have here in the united states really important and again if you don't think europe matters it matters and if europe if there are problems in europe that some way shape or form they're going to manifest themselves into our markets here and i think that's what you're seeing which is why i think citibank is a critical stock to have up as well on your list anyway carter Thank you for joining me today. As always, your voice is extraordinarily yes, important. Again, Dan's on vacation for the week. We wish him well. He will be watching. So we're trying to do our best possible job. But that has been today's market call. I want to thank our sponsors again, FactSet and Open Exchange. Hopefully you like what you saw. We will be here all week. Tomorrow I'll be back at 1 p.m. with the great Danny Moses of Big Short fame. Carter will be back with me on Wednesday. Thank you, CB Dubs. And Liz Young, EY from SoFi, will join us on Thursdays. Enjoy the rest of your day, folks. We are Audi 5000.